I'm always honored to have a chance to talk to the AFWORKS community. You guys inspire me. And I'm really lucky to have you guys um, have a large portion of the AFWORKS community based out of Las Vegas. So it's really exciting to see the innovation that you have going on. And because of that, I have a lot of fun talking to you guys um, about a topic that I am very passionate about, and that is cryptocurrency and its underlying uh, technology of blockchain. Um, but really what I'm excited about most of the time is to kind of get a lay of the land and give people an understanding of what it's actually about and somehow kind of also burst bubbles around what it can and cannot do. Um, and so I know a key area of interest over the last several years in the AFWERTS ecosystem has been around better understanding the applications of cryptocurrency and its underlying technology blockchain. And when looking at the base of the future, naturally exploring how cryptocurrency and blockchain could be applied is going to come up, particularly around topics like security, supply chain, and automation. Um, and so I'm really lucky uh, to have an audience here that has proven to be willing to dig into like the meat and potatoes and use the information given at this fusion conference to inform exploration and decision making within your own projects and departments. So that is why I would like to take this 15 minutes to break down the underlying technology behind cryptocurrency in such a way that it can be useful to each and every one of you in the future of what you guys are doing. All right. So we're going to dig in. This is going to get a little bit technical, so bear with me, especially since I'm going to be talking at you and not be using visual aids here. Um, but I think you'll get it. And part of that is because I'm not sure how many of you have actually heard of blockchain. I feel like at this point, most of you have, especially since a lot of the projects I know come through the competitions and stuff are utilizing some of this technology to solve problems, particularly around sort of inventory management and stuff in, um, in the military. And so uh, when I think about blockchain technology, what I really want you to do is kind of throw away everything you've ever learned about crypto um, and blockchain and anything you've heard in the news or you've heard um, in all the medium articles or things that are interesting. And instead think about blockchain technology as a buffet of um, existing technologies. So essentially what happened is, you know, there was one man back in the financial crisis um, that wanted to uh, essentially, you have a new use case to understand how money could be transferred between individuals. And that new use case basically created what we know as Bitcoin. Um, but the technology that created it, that people refer to as blockchain, uh, really actually is just a combination of existing technologies. And it was just a new way to apply them. And you guys think about that kind of stuff all the time, you know, in, in not only in technology, but also your operational processes when you're building best in class SOPs and all that stuff. And so it's a really great way to kind of translate the components that make up blockchain to understand how they might apply to the base of the future. Um, and so what you'll find is that actually the best solutions might use a combination of the following already widely used technologies. Um, but in order for it to be blockchain, it doesn't have to be all of them. Um, many companies find the best application of blockchain to their businesses to be a custom stack of these like buffet of technologies that suits their unique domain. Um, so for example, uh, Estonia put together a combination of these technologies to be able to validate um, a, a money system that could be backed and verified um, that created more trust than what their government was able to provide for them. So let's talk about the different features that actually make up blockchain. We have hashing, asymmetric keys, immutability, peer-to-peer -peer networks, ordering, and encryption, okay? And most of these you guys have probably heard in some form or another. So let's first talk about hashing. What is it? The algorithmic process of creating a small fingerprint from a larger piece of data that uniquely identifies it and can cryptographically assert existence, uniqueness, or identity of that data. It's really useful when you're talking about things like simplifying and accelerating proof of existence for documents. And when you're looking at storage systems where the contents can be shared or cached based on their contents, it improves efficiency significantly. 
Um, so if, for example, if you're looking at this specifically the way that it was been used in the in the very first use case of Bitcoin, you're looking at basically being able when a transaction happens, um, creating a hash or hashing it. And so it creates a tiny little fingerprint of that large piece of data that's stored as opposed to the entire piece of data about the transaction being stored. Next, we're going to talk about asymmetric keys. So asymmetric cryptography is also known as public key cryptography. Um, so uses of public and private keys to encrypt and decrypt data. The keys are simply large numbers that have been paired together, but are not identical, meaning they're asymmetric. So one key can pair um, to be shared with everyone. That's called a public key. So I kind of always envision, you know, in the movies when they're counting down to the nuke and you have to have both keys in the slot and they're turning it at the same time. Asymmetric keys and technology work exactly the same way, um, except for a lot of times one of those keys is publicly shared so anyone can have access to it. And then the person or the organization that's going to be able to kind of have that sign off to make sure that that thing is accessible is going to have that private key. Um, so this is super useful when you're looking at things like signing documents. Um, we use this publicly a lot when you're signing documents for your bank or transactions, but this can also be used when you're thinking about the base of the future in thinking about, you know, the, the, the different levels of an organization and basically signing off or giving approval for certain orders or things that could be more automated. So basically being able to say, if this meets a certain criteria, we're going to go ahead and let this be approved, um, but making sure that that's done in the most secure way possible. The next thing we're going to talk about is immutability. So immutability is when you're making data unchanging over time, or meaning that like data cannot be changed over time. Um, this becomes really useful because if more databases of say, I don't know, products or inventory or um, really anything switch to storing the whole history instead of storing the actual like specific state of things, they can have a trusted history. And so this is something we call event sourcing. Um, and you'll see like uh, certain companies doing things like this. So if you've ever used um, like uh, Microsoft's Word, they actually have a version control that they're starting to build in. This is also seen in Google Docs or things like that. Um, and that Google or that version history is basically a less secure version of what immutability or event sourcing is. But it's a similar concept. So you can think about that where you want to track you know, the way the state of things have been potentially go back, refer. It's really great when you want to do data comparisons to understand, you know, how things are successfully changing over time. So in order to make that data unchangeable, um, you can make it immutable. And then that is uh, going to make sure that you're not going to be able to um, have any changes in that data. So what you're looking at is accurate. The next thing that we're going to discuss are peer to peer networks. So in a peer-to-peer -peer network, the peers are essentially computer systems, um, which are connected to each other via the internet. So items can be shared directly between systems on the network without the need of a central server. So in other words, each computer on a peer-to-peer -peer network becomes a server as well as the client. This is super useful when you're talking about no single point, it creates like no single points of failure. And it also is really helpful in resource sharing. So if you're starting to think about this in terms of the base of the future, you can really start understanding that instead of having a weak point, that's going to be where everything is. Like I know that in, um, I know that in the corporate world, when we're looking at storing uh, data, right? We're always looking at being able to store data on um, like secure servers to have backups of backups to make sure all of our customer data is, you know, safe for 10 years, 20 years, whatever we need to do. And a lot of times we're using, you know, we're outsourcing the data to these big server farms and they're doing things like putting them in these bomb proof buildings and all of this stuff because it creates a single point of failure that if someone was able to say, take that down, um, then, you know, everything else goes down around it. So the idea of creating a peer to peer network is the idea of being able to ha not have a single point of failure because things live in several places and you don't know what lives in each place, right? It can be randomized. Um, so nothing can be targeted specifically. And also if one thing goes down, the rest of it is not um, connected. So ordering, ordering is also known as consensus. 
And it's only needed if you don't have a single trusted party to decide what order transactions happen in. So for example, um, it's really useful to large number of entities to agree upon the exact order in which operations occurred without trust. So if you think of this in a banking system, um, it's, you know, uh, this money was transferred over here and this money was transferred over here in this order. Usually there's a third party or an accountant or something that's going to be verifying that data. But in this sense, you can use the way the order is and the fact that that order can't be changed to make sure that that's the case. Um, if you have several different systems deployed, you have a consensus algorithm to help decide which system takes over in the event of failure as well. So it's also really it's also really helpful there. And this is something that could be very helpful when looking at the base of the future, because basically it's helping you prioritize. You can set an automated prioritizing for what systems take over in the event of a failure. And we call that load balancing. So encryption. Encryption is an integral part of the inner workings of blockchain technology. Um, it makes data readable by only the intended parties uh, and the sender and the receiver and nobody in between. And all non-trivial computer systems nowadays use at least some kind of encryption as privacy and data access control being basic human rights. So this one's super familiar to you guys. It's useful in storing any sensitive data and only allowing intended parties to read and protecting the data traveling between parties. So as you can imagine, I'm sure that a lot of these things were actually quite familiar to you. And the reason that they created blockchain was the way that these things work together in order to create an immutable chain of transactions that allowed people to exchange money and create a new system of money with trust, right? So they were using a, a they were using hashing to be able to and asymmetric keys to pass the data. They were encrypting that data. It was immutable because the way that they were ordering the data on a chain was create and that chain was then sent to several different peer computers that all had the same chain. So they had the same ledger to look at, made it immutable. And all these different pieces together is what you guys know of as Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and blockchain. So let's talk quickly about how we can start seeing these things used in other cases. Well, we're already seeing them used in a lot of things. Um, there's these things called private permission blockchains, uh, and they use four components of what we just went over. They use asymmetric keys, encryption, hashing, and immutability. Um, for things like version control, we use this all the time when we're developing software technology in, or in enterprise document management, which you guys will see a lot when you have all of your procedures and things that can start being standard, standardized in a digital way. You're using asymmetric keys, encryption, hashing, and immutability. In media delivery, all of you watch YouTube, they're using encryption over P2P, P2P networks and they're using some immutability when tracking uh, when they do a lot of the social stuff. Supply chain, this is something that I know you guys have already started digging into a lot in AFWorks um, of the tracking and verifying location of items and that you're really digging into asymmetric keys and immutability. And in a lot of cases, we're starting to see opportunities for hashing as well as you guys are starting to prove out ways to put, you know, um, physical chips that can be tracked in a specific immutable order in items as well. So when you think about blockchain, don't think of it as it has to be this thing that applies to money being transferred here and here. Instead, think of it as, you know, these are things that you're familiar with, they're terms that you're familiar with, and you can start understanding how you can have viable use cases that can help increase the security and automation of everything that you guys are envisioning towards a base of the future. So you can look at stuff like verifying documents with hashing, um, transparent tracking of, of money orders, things that we definitely don't want to do or storing actual documents or large amounts of data in the things that you're doing. We want to make sure we're using hashing for that stuff. Other things that could be like really cool when you're looking at being able to do things, you know, you've heard a lot of stuff about people trying to use, you know, crypto or blockchain for government elections. Like we are not anywhere close to that. However, we are quite close to being able to have an enclosed community that can do decision making in large organizations like DAOs. And this is something that like the government could take a really close look at because you can validate and make sure that everybody that based on their credentials, you know who they are, which takes 
takes away a lot of the issues around public polling, but it could allow you guys to have a way to make decision making where everyone gets a touch point. It's more automated. It's very secure um, and it really allows everyone's import, input from government organizations. So think about things like sending money overseas. So if you guys are looking to help out your troops or you need to get money quickly into something, you can have no transaction fees or bank hours and you can use some of these blockchain technologies to be able to get money there instantly. Same thing with like document time stamping. So putting a document on an immutable ledger. I'm sure there's a lot of things that need to be tracked when things are off base to get it back to base to make sure that things are recorded properly and in a secure way. Same thing with financial ledgers. So to track payments or donations or relief funds, right? To be able to provide relief funds very quickly, instantaneously in a way that can be used and tracked so that later people can go back and understand, you know, where that money went how it was tracked as opposed to just saying we're going to put you know 15 million to this relief and you guys don't know where it went or the impact it had so there's so many exciting ways that you guys can do this so what i'm going to leave you with because i do think i'm running a minute over time and i do apologize um is a couple quick considerations for you guys to think about and as you think as you guys are looking at a lot of these other presentations that are coming through they're going to be talking about exciting topics and i guarantee a lot of these topics are going to have pieces and components of this stuff in it and so you can start thinking how can we you know in you how can we get more security and more automation in these ideas that we're having based on what i've been fed earlier in the day here so the considerations size of data always huge consideration you want to make sure you're not trying to put all of the data on something you only need to hash it you only need to do that to create an immutable thing. And that's going to make everything, all of your systems faster, more agile, easier to get it from one place to another. Also, you want to be careful when conforming to existing data standards um, in both terms of structure and transport for sharing information that could prove to be like an initial hurdle. So you guys have a ton of existing data standards or the way things have been set up in your systems. So you want to make sure that there's a lot of understanding that when you're, you're doing a lot of those new exciting technologies or things that you want to bring in, what's that going to look like in, in being able to merge or conform to what's already existing. And then understanding the clear regulatory frameworks that really need to be defined for the implementation of agreements and as digital smart contracts. So really like making sure that anybody that's being brought into the discussion around security and automation is also, you're also going to be looking for those people that are building those processes. Like if you're putting, you know, um, some of your standard operating procedures on a framework, you want those people that are doing the standard operating procedures to have input on how they're working in the process that's happening before the technology piece of how it's going to be delivered to them gets put in place. So making sure really all parties are at the table. So that's all I have for you. Um, this topic is super interesting to me. I'll be available on Slack and I really look forward to hearing the rest of the day and the exciting innovations for this the base of the future. Thank you.